thanks, Jerry. Thank you for the invitation to speak with you all today. So I'm really excited to share some work that we're doing um, using iron zanes and garnet to probe um, the operations of the Earth's deep oxygen cycle. So we're going to look at trends over both space and time here. Okay, so before we get into the fine detail, I just want to start by acknowledging my collaborators in this project and my funding source, um, which is NSF. Uh, so like I mentioned earlier, I'm splitting my time right now as a postdoc between the Smithsonian Institution and Yale um, before heading next week to a faculty job at Cornell. None of this work would be possible without my collaborators at Art on National Lab, uh, Tony Lanzarotti and Matt Newville. So uh, thanks, guys. All right, so why do we care about the Earth's deep oxygen cycle? So we think in large part that the conditions on atmospheres and surfaces are set by the redox state of the planetary interior. So you can simply contrast Earth and Mars here. Uh, the the um, rocks that compose Earth's upper mantle uh, are more oxidized than the rocks that compose the upper mantle of Mars. Right, we have a plate tectonic cycle on Earth while Mars does not we have an oxygen-rich atmosphere on Earth while Mars does not. And so maybe um, these two things are, are perhaps closely linked, uh, the occurrence of a plate tectonic cycle and an atmosphere that can support complex life. You can think about how the transfer of oxygen from the deep Earth uh, facilitates an oxygen-rich atmosphere just through these two very simple electron exchange reactions I have on the bottom of the screen here. You reduce the amount of oxygen, we drive our equations to the left, Earth would be a really different place if our volcanoes emitted uh, explosive hydrogen gas and poisonous carbon monoxide um, versus life-sustaining water vapor and climate warming CO2. And so we think that there's a link between um, the, the uh, plate tectonic cycle and the buildup of oxygen in our atmosphere. Right? So for you non-geologists in the audience, um, this is kind of the plate tectonics view of Earth a 2D cross-section of a mid-ocean ridge that's on the right of this cartoon, um, and uh, a continental arc um, that's generated in a subduction zone on the left side of this cartoon. So what's happening here is our mantle is experiencing decompression melting at our mid-ocean ridge. We're generating a basaltic magma. So basalts, if you're not familiar, these are silica-poor, iron and magnesium-rich magmas. So our basalt is generated at our mid-ocean ridge, um, and it's, as it's traversing the seafloor, it's interacting with, in modern times, what we know is an oxygen-rich seawater. So this interaction, we're changing um, our iron 2 plus in our basalt to iron 3 plus. Our basalt is, uh, is becoming hydrated, it's gaining water. So eventually our oceanic crust, our basalt, reaches our um, convergent margin here, our subduction zone. It's being drawn uh, deeper into the earth and undergoing a metamorphic phase transformation. So this rock is densifying as it's going into um, higher temperature and higher pressure zones here. What we know is that once these um, metamorphic uh, basalts, called metabasalts, uh, reach a certain temperature, they're going to start to lose some of this fluid they've gained um, over, with their, over their interaction with the ocean, uh, and they might even start to melt. So there's a mass transfer of uh, material from the slab to the overlying arc. Um, this fluid uh, fluxes um, our continental arc here um, in the overlying mantle um, and uh, causes melting, generating um, continental arc lavas um, in our subduction zone. So the fundamental observation here is that uh, basalts that erupt at continental arcs are more oxidized than basalts that erupt um, at mid-ocean ridges. So we can't directly measure the amount of oxygen in these rocks and we need a proxy to determine their oxidation state. Um, so one uh, popular way to do that is by um, looking at the relative valence states of um, iron in these different rocks um, through, for instance, iron zanes. Uh, so we know um, that arc basalts have a greater amount of ferric to total iron um, than mid-ocean ridge basalts. Okay, so this is, these two um, parameters here, these two observations, these are widely agreed upon. Uh, what's hotly debated is the mechanism um, um, of, of why. Why are arc basalts more oxidized than mid-ocean ridge basalts? Uh, one leading theory is that this mass transfer of material um, from the slab to the overlying mantle is oxidized. But we have no direct observations of these fluids, right? So we don't know what the oxidation state of these fluids are. 
What we can probe, though, is the oxidation state of these high pressure rocks that are left behind. Um, and these are called eclogites. So eclogites form when you take your mid-oceanic ridge basalt, you subject it to really high pressures and temperatures, um, and you form a, a very dense metamorphic rock. Right? And so that is what I'm going to talk about today uh, and what I'm going to examine. You know, what do eclogites on subducting slabs tell us? Are they reduced? Are they oxidized? Um, has their oxidation state changed over time? And does it change over space as well? But first I need to introduce uh, my variable, and that's oxygen fugacity. So if you're not familiar, geologists refer to the oxidation state of a rock as its oxygen fugacity. So you can think about this really simply just with an um, iron uh, and oxygen system. So you write an equation here where we're oxidizing iron metal to iron oxide, um, also known as the, uh, in mineral form, as wustite. And so we have a chemical equation. We can write an equilibrium constant. Uh, because we have two pure phases here, uh, the activity of these phases goes to one. What we're left with is that our equilibrium constant is equal to one divided by the activity of oxygen, um, or uh, the activity of oxygen, also known as oxygen fugacity. What I have on this graph is um, showing where this phase boundary is between iron metal um, and the mineral wustite iron oxide as a function of temperature on the x-axis. Uh, and on the y-axis, you have um, log oxygen fugacity. So of course, as uh, log FO2 decreases, we're becoming more reduced. As it increases, we're becoming more oxidized. What's important to note here is that um, not only is this phase transition sensitive to the abundance of oxygen in your system, it's also really sensitive to temperature. So in order to you know, see through the effects of temperature, uh, geologists have to reference their oxygen fugacities to uh, a mineral equilibria buffer. So the iron wustite buffer uh, is one um, such buffer. So here are a few important buffers for terrestrial systems. So you can think of, for instance, the iron wustite buffer as describing the conditions at the core mantle boundary, um, you know, where you have iron um, in the metal in the core in equilibrium with iron oxide um, in minerals in the lower mantle. For reference, our atmosphere contains 21% oxygen, uh, which would mean the log FO2 of our atmosphere is about negative uh, 0.7. So there's a huge range in oxygen fugacity as we span um, you know, the core to the atmosphere. We're talking about you know, over 20 uh, log units here. But when you think of oxygen fugacity in the solid earth, even a difference of one log unit is really important um, because that one log unit difference is um, the difference between generating you know, dense oceanic crust at a mid-ocean ridge versus generating um, buoyant continental magmas um, at arcs. So I wanna um, emphasize this buffer that I have in uh, blue or purple here uh, that's labeled QFM. So these are the conditions where the minerals quartz Phthalate and magnetite are all stable. So this is an important uh, reference buffer. I'm going to reference all of my oxygen fugacities um, for the rest of this talk to this buffer. Um, and uh, it's really convenient because we know that uh, mid-ocean ridge basalts uh, record oxygen fugacities very close um, to this buffer. So it's a, a good reference point. Okay, so we've established what oxygen fugacity is. Um, what is an eclogite for those of you who might not be familiar? So an eclogite, um, this is, it's a really beautiful metamorphic rock. Again, it forms from when you take this basalt and you bring it to high pressures and temperatures. Uh, and this has kind of, they call it a Christmas rock. It has um, just, you know, these beautiful red and green minerals. So the green mineral is pyroxene, uh, the red mineral is garnet. And both of these uh, minerals form solid solutions um, with a range of, of end members um, that can be calcium rich, magnesium rich, um, iron rich, um, and for pyroxene, sodium rich as well. Um, so these pyroxene and garnet are the two main phases in eclogite, but it can also contain um, what we call accessory minerals. So these are minerals in lower abundance like quartz uh, and rutile. Yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, we can't directly measure the amount of oxygen um, in rocks. So we need a good proxy uh, for, to determine the activity of oxygen, the oxidation state that these rocks are recording. So just like I wrote uh, you know, a chemical equation showing how you can oxidize iron metal at the um, iron wustite buffer, you can also write um, an oxygen transfer equation uh, between eclogitic minerals. So what you're looking at right here um, is a chemical a mineral equilibria that was calibrated by Stanio and coworkers in 2015. Um, so what's happening here is that 
you're taking two moles of ferrous iron in the mineral pyroxene uh, and oxidizing them to two moles of ferric iron um, in garnet. So this calcium iron um, end member in garnet is called andradite. So in order to use this um, oxybarometer and get back at an oxygen capacity, we need to be able to measure um, the amount of ferric to total iron in our garnet because that plays into um, our calculation of the activity of the andrandite end member. Okay, so there are several different ways um, you can measure the amount of ferric to total iron in garnet, sweat chemistry, moss power, um, you can also use the electron microprobe um, to quantify this, but of course, you know, this is um, a, a Zane's, a ZAS community, so we're gonna use Zane spectroscopy to measure uh, the ferric to total iron in our eclogitic garnets. So I'll stop for some questions. Okay, uh, uh, that's uh, great. Uh, I have a couple questions while people are typing in their questions on chat. Um, you mentioned that sometimes you have accessory minerals that could include titanium, for example. Mm -hmm. um, is there any attempt to use the titanium oxidation state as uh, uh, another sensor for fugacity? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So. Um, the only uh, issue with um, using, for instance, the abundance of titanium 3 plus to titanium 4 plus is that um, you only get titanium, uh, really measurable amounts of titanium 3 plus under really um, reducing conditions. Oh, so more, we're thinking more like solar system conditions than, um, you know, terrestrial conditions. But that certainly could be done. Uh -huh. The benefit of using um, iron is that um, there's more of a dynamic um, range of, of where you're, you know, increasing the amount of ferric to total iron over a wider range of FO2 than you are for titanium. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Is there um, any other metal that might be uh, present, although certainly not as abundant as iron, that would also give you a large range? Yeah, well, vanadium. <laughs> vanadium. Okay. We did a lot of work on vanadium um, as well, and uh, uh, th th there's there's a lot to get into there. But so you can imagine that uh, if you have rutile um, and you have titanium three and four plus, that you're going to have um, substitutions with vanadium three and four plus as well. So there are a lot of um, interesting things you can do with vanadium in ecologics. Sorry for another day. All right. Um... Oh, hang on, uh, some, we have something in the chat. What about manganese is one question. Uh, yes, ma manganese, absolutely. Garnets um, contain a, a lot of manganese, so you, you could do that as well. Not sure if anyone's come out with a calibration for, for manganese and, and garnet, but that would be their interest. When someone's doing a calibration, does that mean they do a high temperature study along the equilibrium curve? and measure the uh, uh, ionization state ratio? Is that what's involved? Yeah, so, well, you're basically just, um, you know, coming up, you have standards, right, that have um, previously determined, uh, you know, ratios. Um, so, for instance, we, in our garnet calculation, um, we have garnets that have their ferric iron content previously determined by moss power. Uh -huh. So you just need, you need a garnet that someone has already figured out, you know, what the different valence states of manganese is in it, so that you can compare the shift in spectral features as you, um, you know, are changing your manganese valence state in your in your spectra to, you know, what the true um, manganese valence value. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, then um, uh, you should continue. Thank you. Okay, so this is the crystal structure of garnet. So like I said before, it's a solid solution where um, your X cation is uh, divalent and your Z cation is trivalent. So garnet is a cubic mineral, um, which means that it's isotropic. So it's really convenient for us because we don't have to um, correct our Zane spectra for uh, orientation effects. Um, so for iron, uh, when you have um, ferrous iron, it's sitting in the dodecahedral site. As you start to add in more ferric iron, uh, it's going to shift into that Z uh, octahedral site, that six-fold site. All right, so I'm definitely not the first person to do um, iron zanes in garnet, um, which is great because it gives me um, a lot of, you know, a great guide um, for my work. So both um, Darby Dyer and uh, Andrew Berry have published 
a Garnet Zanes calibrations before. So what they've done is taken garnets um, that have previously determined ferric to total iron measurements, um, in this case um, from Mossbauer spectroscopy, and then looked at how um, the spectral features uh, shift as a function of increasing ferric iron. So this is uh, as all the spectra um, from Darby's 2012 paper, where she's uh, taken garnets from 0% you know, ferric iron to 100% ferric iron. Um, and that's what's noted in those um, the kind of small um, numbers there. And looked at the, you know, how the, there's shifts in the spectral features. So what you can see here is that both the iron, um, this is all iron K edge zanes, you can see that the um, position of the edge is shifting, um, but the XF um, spectra also look significantly different as you increase from you know, zero to 100% uh, ferric iron. So um, both Darby, um, Dyer, and Andrew Berry have um, looked at three different spectral features and, and looked at you know, how they're changing. Um, one, the position of the area normalized centroid. Uh, two, the ratio of energies, um, the ratio of intensities at two different energy positions. Uh, and then three, looking at how um, the energy um, position of the K edge and a normalized intensity has changed. Um, what they found is that in general, this, um, the position of the area normalized centroid um, is not really sensitive to changing uh, ferric to total iron and garnet below about 20% um, ferric to total iron, uh, which is unfortunate because um, that's the range that we expect uh, for garnets um, from our, the mantle and from eclogites. So um, we're building our own calibration. Um, we're kind of crossing out looking at the position of the area normalized centroid um, as a function of ferric to total iron. But we are going to look at um, these two other um, techniques. So these are images um, from Barry et al. Uh, 2010. What he found is that um, the amount of ferric to total iron in his garnet standards um, correlates with the intensity ratios of um, two energy positions in kind of the near edge um, XF's region, and that this ratio changes dynamically as you go from you know, zero um, to 100 percent ferric iron. He also find, found that the amount of ferric iron correlates um, well with the uh, energy of the iron K edge at normalized intensity. So he's, you can normalize the intensity. So basically all you're doing here is normalizing the XF's region um, to one, uh, and then you're going in and looking at intensity of, of 0.9, um, and then you know, seeing where that falls um, on the energy position of the edge at that normalized intensity. So both of these techniques um, seem to you know, be tracking these changes in ferric to total iron and garnet quite well. And so we are going to examine um, how both of these features change in our uh, calibration, uh, which has been done at the advanced photon source. So uh, one of the great things about being at the Smithsonian is you have the world's uh, largest rock and ore collection next door. Um, and so there are plenty of garnets there we can use to you know, build our garnet iron zanes calibration. So what we've done is we've taken um, both experimental um, and natural garnets on loan from the National Rock and Ore Collection that have previously determined ferric total iron measurements uh, from Mossbauer. So we're looking at a range of composition of garnet compositions here, uh, and they vary from more slab-like, and these are our eclogitic garnets, to more mantle-like garnets. These are um, peridotitic garnets. So what's key to remember here is that eclogitic garnets contain more calcium and less magnesium. Um, than peridotitic garnets. What I'm showing you here is an image um, uh, taken of, a, of one of my experiments at um, the advanced photon source. This is a reflected light microscope image um, where you can see this is a garnet I grew in a high pressure experiment um, that has a, a spot on it um, that's the yellow circle here. What I just want to emphasize is that for this work, especially for what I'm doing, it's key to have the smallest um, spot size you possibly can. We're using the two by two um, focus micron spot uh, because we need um, our spectra to be free of mineral inclusions. We wanna get garnet only spectra. So when you look at these you know, experimental garnets in this reflected light view, you can see that there's some, there's some mineral inclusions in them, but it looks like there's a lot of clean surface area. Um, not so much when you look at this and this is a transmitted light image, and you can see there are just tons of tiny micron size, micro light little inclusions in there. 
And so it's, it's really key to have a very um, focused spot size because both experimental and natural garnets are just chock full of inclusions. Okay, so we've used these um, two different techniques. These, we're looking at the position um, of the edge at a normalized uh, intensity of 90% here and examining how um, that, that uh, feature changes as a function of ferric to total iron and garnet in our, these are all of our calibration standards. And these are our, our knowns. So as you increase from, you know, 1% ferric iron to 100% ferric iron, you know, there's a, there, there, a very dynamic change um, in the position of the edge. So that's about, you know, 6 EV right there, a shift in the um, edge position at 90% intensity. But the air, like, you know, the area we really care about here are these low ferric iron um, standards. So when you zoom in, uh, what we see is that um, the, the energy shift, uh, the edge energy shift is really small. We're kind of butting up against the uh, 0.1 EV um, resolution of our system here. Um, so I just want to really emphasize that, you know, when you're looking at really um, small changes in the position of the edge, it's really important to monitor um, for any uh, energy drift that could be happening over um, your session by using uh, an internal standard. I should mention that the uh, uncertainties, the um, error in the X direction is from uncertainties in the Mossbauer measurements. So the typical uncertainty of, of um, ferric ion determinations from Mossbauer is about plus or minus 3%. And the uncertainties, um, the error in the Y direction is from a standard deviation of three or more measurements on our garnet standard. So these are our garden standards of all compositions. Um, they're all, you know, fit well um, with, a, they all conform to a linear relationship. Um, we don't, aren't seeing any real compositional dependence um, with this um, data reduction technique. We also used uh, the ratios and intensities to see how um, this reproduces the amount of ferric to total iron in our garnet standards. So this fit with the second um, order polynomial here. Again, we zoom in on our low ferric iron standards, the region we care about, and um, a real compositional dependence of this feature starts to fall out. So our eclogitic garnets, again, these are our more calcium-rich, magnesium-poor garnets. Um, the ratio of intensity at a given um, ferric iron content is really different um, than the rest of our standards, uh, which are in the darker green. And those standards tend to be more peridotitic, less calcium, more magnesium. So um, what we think that we're, you know, probing at these um, different energy positions is likely something to do with this um, maybe calcium iron bonding. Okay, so what we really need to, um, if you want to use this technique, what you really need to have is a wide range of standards um, that have, you know, the same uh, ferric iron content but different compositions. Um, unfortunately, we just don't have um, those standards. They're just not available. Um, it's, you know, garnets with moss bar on them are, are relatively um, rare already. So, but we do have three standards that have 5.4% um, ferric iron uh, in different grossular contents. Um, so grossular is the calcium aluminum um, rich garnet end member. Androdite is of course our calcium ferric iron rich end member. So you can see that our intensity ratio is um, decreasing exponentially as our mole percent grossular increases. So what um, this intensity ratio is probing not only has to do with the total amount of ferric iron, but also something to do with its, its bonding with calcium. So again, we only have three data points, but we don't see any sort of obvious um, relationship between the grossular content of our garnet standards and um, the uh, energy position of our K-edge at normalized intensity. So this is a technique that we uh, go with and we apply to our unknowns. Um, to talk about later on. So I just want to emphasize the importance of overabsorption correcting uh, the garnet spectra in order to, you know, get at um, the, sort of the real ferric iron content here. So garnets, especially garnets from eclogites, are really iron rich. Um, this is the chemical formula for one of our garnet standards. You can see it contains a considerable amount um, of iron. And this is an uncorrected spectra here in black. When we correct this spectra for um, overabsorption, you can see that the intensity of the edge increases by quite a bit. Um, but what we really care about, of course, is what's happening in here, the position of the edge at normalized intensity. 
So again, our uncorrected spectra is in black, our uh, corrected spectra is in red. And so if you just went with the uncorrected spectra, I mean, what we're seeing here is a shift of 0.21 EV. And because we're looking at these extremely small shifts um, in the position of the edge with increasing ferric iron content, that corresponds to a difference of about 7% um, ferric to total iron in garnet. So it's really important if you want to apply this technique that you're um, correcting your spectra for overabsorption. Any questions? Yes, there's several. This is great. Um, we'll start with Matthew Marcus. I think you had two questions, Matthew. Uh, you're muted, Matthew. Okay, now I'm not. Okay, uh, first uh, you mentioned area normalized centroid. Did you mean the, uh, the, uh, the pre-edge peaks? Yes. Yes, the, the area weighted uh, position of the pre-edge peaks. Okay, because that's been one of the standard methods. And uh, it also asked how you deal with overabsorption. And uh, you acknowledge that, uh, that this is a problem. Uh, is your present method one that uh, where you go from the known composition? Because if so, then you would have to, uh, for your unknowns, you would have to know what the composition was. Yes. So you do have to know what the composition is. Um, and that's uh, something that's um, fairly easy to do using, um, for instance, like an electron microscope. Um, so that, that's definitely, in, in order to make sense of the spectra, yes, you do have to know the composition. Yeah, and also I was wondering about the possibility of L-edge sticks, because so, that gives you a small spot size that you don't have to worry about inclusions. And uh, so, uh, as Peter Botts or somebody else mentioned, that it could be sent really sensitive. Oh yeah, Yang Ha. There's a nice method by Von Aken, which seems to work for pretty nicely for uh, reading off valence states. Oh, I, I'm, um, I'll have to look into that. I'm, I'm not aware of that um, contribution. How Thanks thin, for bringing it to my attention. How thin does the sample have to be, Matthew, for that to, uh, for that to work? It has to be something like uh, a micron, maybe, or maybe less. Okay, the sure. TEM kind of thing. Yeah, so it's something, so I'm thinning all of these samples by hand, so there may be, you know, they're probably between 10 and 30 microns thick. Yeah, but, you won't um, get yeah, anything I, I, that. Yeah, I definitely get the, the fib in there. Yeah, it would have, yeah, it would have to be fibbed, and uh, I know some people who, who do fib on these, uh, on, well, like, they, they do oxybarometer work for extraterrestrial reasons, you know, meteorites and such, and uh, for their standards, they grow, they make samples just like you do, and then thin them. You know, do fib and take them to the sticks and yeah that, that would absolutely make life easier <laughs> okay um uh let's see i've got uh, there was also a question i lost my glasses there was a question um about whether this is a sort of normal tfy zanes or if it's herfty uh i i would describe it as normal um okay. But so you didn't I, have, you didn't I, have I, a I analyzer. For, for very in-depth questions, I, I might would have to refer back to uh, Matt and Tony. No. Yes, this this is total this is total fluorescent yield. It was a solid state detector. Yes. Got it. Um, a, a couple more questions. Um, it's really interesting that you're um, uh, trying to find the most effective metric, whether it's a ninety percent level or ratio at two energies or what have you. Um, has there been any work to uh, try to use modern data science tools to let the computer try to find what is the uh, uh, where where and how is the interesting oxidation state information encoded in the zanes? You mean machine learning, for example. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, I know um, Darby Dyer, who work I, I showed you, um, is making a big push into this area. Okay. Um, it's not something that I've explored yet, um, but yes, there's also, obviously there's all sorts of information in the full spectra that you're leaving behind when you just look at um, the position of, of the edge at normalized intensity. Okay. Um, we're, we're looking for the most precise um, calibration though. So I think that, um, so, you know, we're, we're, so some of these things when you use the whole, whole spectra, you're maybe introducing um, less precision as, as well. Okay. Yeah, one of the uh, previous speakers in this series actually talked to, showed one of these machine learning methods where it's essentially a least squares fit where the machine selects the uh, or selects the weights and the uh, and, and the energy positions. Interesting. 
Okay. Or uh, actually, not at least for fit, but just a, a waiting, waited sum. Yes, that's, that's essentially what Darby's approach is doing, and we're working on being able to do that for more of these samples. But the work that Megan and Andrew and Liz have done is also very precise. Okay, excellent. We're looking for the, the big thing is precision, right? At these things, you're looking at you know shifts between one one percent, two percent, three percent ferric iron. So um, I, I'm uh, interested in whatever gets me the the greatest precision, certainly. Of course. Um, uh, related to that, um, of course, you're very sensitive, as you talked with Matthew about earlier, to the uh, self-absorption correction. Um, have you considered uh, trying this method of inverse fluorescence yield, which I know is much more common for lower energy measurements, where here you would, for example, look at the uh, magnesium fluorescence coming off the sample to get a depth, uh, a penetration depth correction? No, I, I haven't. I haven't done that, but I'm, it sounds very interesting. Then, it, then you could um, eliminate the need for uh, additional measurements of composition. Yeah, exactly. That's that's why I brought it up. Um, and uh, last question is um, uh, on the garnets. Has there been uh, much work to try to do X-ray emission spectroscopy that could give you a complementary way to uh, get at least a little bit of a handle on oxidation state, though it may not have the precision you need. Uh, I haven't tried it yet, but I'm I'm certainly interested. Okay. Um, uh, Liz, did you have a, a comment or a, a question you wanted to ask? No, I was just uh, contributing to the conversation on chat about the machine uh, learning approach. I think the if the problem we've run into that um, for for iron zanes anyway is that. You, when you use the whole spectrum, you convolve changes in coordination with changes in formal valence state. And because we're interested in, you know, the oxidation state in most cases, um, it's, it's helpful to look at specific spectral features that can be assigned to site changes in the mineral as opposed to kind of a uh, you know, um, an eigenvalue, uh, a minimization of, a, of a, a combination of features that may mix different kinds of information because the sample sizes that we're working to calibrate with are quite small, right? As Megan said, it's very difficult to find, for example, garnets uh, that have Mossbauer referenced information. Yeah, infinite, um, standards, that, that'd be an awesome thing to do, but working with um, the, the limited compositional range we have. The, the machine really needs uh, big data. Okay, um, uh, why don't you continue, Megan? This excellent discussion. Yeah, thanks. thanks for the great questions. Okay, so we've established that we can measure the amount of ferric to total iron in our garnet. We can propagate that then into our calculations of oxygen fugacity. So we can start to ask some really interesting questions about um, eclogy oxidation states. Uh, so one, does eclogy oxygen fugacity change over time? So this is a graph, it's showing you oxidation state reference to the QFM buffer. So as we become more negative, we become uh, more and more reducing um, versus age. Uh, and these data points are some of the first um, published eclogy oxygen fugacities um, that have been derived using this um, oxybarometer equation that I showed you earlier. And so we actually really don't have a great idea right now about the oxygen fugacities recorded um, by eclogites. Uh, but, you know, these, this kind of, in our limited data set here, um, you know, you were kind of squinting. You could maybe see a trend here um, that as the, these rocks, um, as eclogites are, become older, they're recording a more reducing uh, environments. So the idea being that, you know, under modern day conditions, we have these rocks erupting on the ocean floor. They're interacting in this, with oxidized seawater, um, but our oceans weren't always so oxidized. So if you're subducting something that's originally um, more reducing, uh, contains less oxygen, um, you know, how does that um, translate into what's being um, formed at high pressures and temperatures deep in subduction zones? Um, so maybe you would expect perhaps that older eclogites um, would record, uh, you know, a more reducing environment because their precursor was perhaps more reduced. 
Um, you can also ask, you know, do equidite oxygen fugacities change um, with depth? And so uh, there is good reason to believe that equidites um, would record more reducing conditions as they go deeper into the earth. Um, the, uh, it's, it's, this is sort of a, the reason behind this is fairly complex, um, but to say for now that it is, this is a very thermodynamically viable hypothesis. Uh, and so, um, you know, can we draw a line between um, the eclogite precursor uh, basalts um, that are up near the Earth's surface uh, to what's, you know, to the oxygen fugacities of what's formed from this precursor at depth? Again, um, we need, you know, more samples to really, you know, kind of flesh this out, but you can see that, you know, these um, eclogite xenoliths um, that are in red, these are um, from South Africa, and the eclogite xenoliths that are in teal, and these are from uh, Canada, that, you know, as they become more reducing, um, or as they become, um, uh, as they form deeper in the earth, you know, maybe they become more reducing as well. So we're going to test these two hypotheses in two um, different sample suites of eclogites. So our first suite is from Syros, um, from the Cyclades subduction complex in the Greek Isles. My uh, collaborator at Yale had a re just really tough time collecting these rocks, uh, enjoying the beautiful um, Greek Isles. So really um, feel sorry for him, H had, had to go out and get these rocks for us. Um, so they're about 45 million years old, um, and all the rocks we're looking at from Syros uh, formed at the same temperature and pressure. So they're all formed at around 66 kilometers um, deep in the earth. Um, I forgot to mention that in terms of uh, so pressure, um, on a pressure scale, uh, we express this commonly um, for earth systems as gigapascals. So about one gigapascal is equivalent to about 33 kilometers deep in the earth. Uh, and then we're also looking at eclogites um, from Koidu. Um, this, these are eclogite xenoliths from Sierra Leone. So the xenolith um, is a fragment of an eclogite that's been subducted, typically very deep, and it comes back to the surface um, often in a kimberlite eruption. So it's entrained um, in, um, in um, a, a, a kimberlites, which erupt um, very vigorously and come to the surface um, very fast. Uh, and so these xenoliths are around 3 billion years old. That's sort of the youngest estimated date because their, their ages are a little bit imprecise. Uh, and we have um, xenoliths uh, from Koidu from a range of pressures and temperatures from around 100 to 150 kilometers deep. What I'm showing you here are compositional maps for iron. So this is showing you where the iron is located in our eclogites. Uh, so the light purple color, those are the garnets. Um, that's indicating that these are the, you know, most iron-rich phases on these maps. You can see that um, there's a, kind of a big difference between the garnets in Cirrus and the garnets um, from Koidu. Our garnets from Cirrus um, contain a lot of mineral inclusions, um, while the garnets from Koidu don't. So these Koidu garnets, they were, some, you know, they're very ancient. They were hanging out deep in the earth for a long time. Um, they had a chance to equilibrate and kind of get rid of some of these mineral inclusions that aren't uh, stable. Um, deep in the earth um, before coming back up to the surface. Okay, so we've taken our eclogite suites uh, to the advanced photon source. We've measured the amount of ferric to total iron in our garnets, um, and then we've used those to calculate our oxygen fugacity from um, this uh, oxybarometer here. So what I'm showing you are uh, the amount of ferric to total iron in garnet on the x-axis versus the oxygen fugacity you calculate um, from this equation, uh, this oxybarometer on the y-axis. So all of our eclogites from Cirrus um, are from the same pressures and temperatures. We can say that the average oxygen fugacity recorded by these rocks is um, about one and a half log units below the quartz phthalate magnetite um, oxygen buffer. So these rocks are reduced relative to their, to their mid-ocean ridge more precursor that we know the oxygen fugacity of quite well. Um, our rocks from Koidu, they're from various pressures and temperatures, various depth, um, and they um, record, you know, a range of oxygen fugacities, um, you know, significantly, in, in general, significantly more reducing than our Cirrus rocks. You know, what's in, yeah, I'll just draw your attention to here um, quickly is that, notice that um, the, uh, you can have a range of ferric to total iron in garnet, and it doesn't really impact the oxygen fugacity that you calculate using this oxy barometer. So we have two garnets that record, um, you know, one, you know, less than 2% ferric iron and one more than 6% ferric iron, 
and yet, you know, they're yielding the same oxygen, the exact same oxygen fugacity. Part of the reason for that is because of this really big um, dependence of the oxygen fugacity you calculate on what we call the um, Hedenbergite component in CPX. That's the calcium ferrous iron um, pyroxene end member. And so part of the um, work I'm doing now is some experiments to um, come up with a new oxybarometer where we can get rid of this term and really see how um, the, you know, the amount of ferric iron in garnet is going to change as a direct function of oxygen fugacity without worrying about a uh, kind of kerosene. What I want to stress here is that these um, values are averages um, for um, four different samples from Koidu and uh, five different samples here from Ciros, right? And that's because they're averages because we see changes in the amount of ferric to total iron in our garnets as we go from core to rim. So I'm showing you again another iron compositional map. Uh, this is a garnet from Ciros. What you're seeing here is that um, there's a lot of iron um, that's in the red that's uh, in the core of this garnet, um, and the rim contains less garnet. So the way you would interpret this is that this core grew progressively during prograde metamorphism, um, meaning that uh, this garnet started to grow um, uh, under high pressure and temperature conditions, um, and then sort of expanded here as it was subducted deeper into the earth. So you're creating a prograde path um, while the um, rim, which has less iron, uh, grew as this eclogite was coming back up to the surface. So we've um, done traverses uh, across a lot of our garnets from both Cirrus and Koidu. And what's remarkable is that we see differences in the amount of ferric to total iron as we go from core to rim. Uh, so this, what this garnet is recording is that um, there is more uh, ferric iron um, when this garnet began to grow and by the time then um, there was by the time it stopped growing, um, in the subduction zone. So what this is suggesting is that there is some transfer, perhaps, of oxidized components from your eclogite into another phase, um, perhaps a, a fluid that's then leaving your subduction zone and um, transiting um, up to the continental arc. So if this is you know, kind of borne out, what this would suggest is that this idea that eclogites and subducting slabs are transferring oxidized material um, to the continental arc um, you know, th this, this um, data is right in line um, with that theory. Okay, so let's get back to our two questions here. Does eclogite oxygen fugacity change with increasing depth? Um, for our samples, um, the ones I've directly dealt with, we can say yes. There actually is, you know, you could definitely draw a straight line um, between our, our two sample sets here, between um, Ciros, um, which is shallower, uh, and Koidu, which is deeper, they record a progressive decrease um, in, uh, eclogite oxidation, in eclogite oxidation state as they um, become deeper. Um, and then, you know, you combine that with the um, previously um, uh, measured uh, data from these other co-authors as well. Again, you know, of course there's scatter here, but you can definitely draw a negative slope um, through these data. You can also, ex also examine does eclogite oxygen fugacity changes, change over time. Ciros um, are very young, only 45 million years old. Koidu, very old. Of course, what's also kind of overlain on, and interpolated on top of, you know, our age trends is depth trends. So really old um, eclogite xenoliths tend to equilibrate very deep um, in cratons uh, and come back up to the surface. And so just by nature, um, these uh, very old rocks record um, greater depth than these very young rocks. But again, you know, you could definitely draw a line through these data points that has a negative slope. Um, of course, we need um, more data, more Zanes measurements um, to really, you know, flesh out these trends completely. Okay, so I will stop here and just leave you with my take-home messages. Um, you know, we've shown that iron Zanes and garnet, um, if you have a great calibration, it can, is, it's a precise way um, to measure, you know, the amount of ferric to total iron in your garnet unknowns, require, but it requires that, you know, you have standards of irrelevant composition um, or a composition independent calibration, and you also need to pay careful attention to how you're correcting your data um, for both, you know, overabsorption and possible um, drift over time. Our current data suggests that eclogite oxygen fugacities may decrease with increasing depth and age, um, but we need, you know, more data to flesh out these trends. I'll just uh, end here again by um, acknowledging everyone that's uh, helped me on this project.
happy to take more questions. Thank you. That's um, uh, uh, that's great. While we're waiting for people to type in questions, um, can you tell us a bit about what you intend to work on next? Yes. Um, sure. I have some. I have. I have some slides. I have a lot of slides. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, th this is something that's sort of on the same vein that maybe won't re will require less explanation than some of the other projects I'm I'm working on, but. Um, you know, so one of the things that we think we know pretty well is that the amount of ferric iron and garnet changes um, with depth. So that that de change, you know, increasing depth, but you both in the earth increases both temperature and pressure. But what we don't have good constraints on is, you know, if you keep those variables constant, if you keep, you know, your garnet composition relatively constant and keep temperature and pressure constant, how does oxidation state change how much ferric iron is incorporated in garnet? So these are some experiments that I've done, um, and this is why we're, we're using this extremely small spot size of looking at the amount of ferric iron in experimental garnets, all at the same pressures um, and at different temperatures. So this is kind of, kind of early days of this data, and these are just, these are not the expected relation. You could fit these lines in a few different ways, I guess I'll say. But this, this is a pretty good approximation of the relationships for now. So what you see is that, as we expect, we increase temperature, we increase the incorporation of ferric iron and garnet, um, but it's also really dependent on oxygen fugacity. And so we're trying to examine you know, how, how this changes um, independently um, in, in experiments as well. So it has really important implications for um, how rocks evolve <laughs> in the earth. Okay. Neat. Um, we have a question. Uh, how variable might the fugacity be within a slab for a given depth of subduction? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, so there's some there's some data that show that um, it, what what you're subducting, you know, the FO2 of what you're subducting changes over extremely small, um, you know, spatial scales. So that you know, if you you have the the sediments that are coming down in a subduction zone. Um, some of them, you know, might be oxidized, some of them might be reduced. Um, if you're subducting like manganese chert, those could be really oxidized while you're, you know, the slab is more reduced. Um, it, it's, it, it can be very highly variable. And so I, I think that what we're, we're looking at here, these are all, um, you know, meta basalts. Um, and so we're looking at the slab only. But certainly, you know, this basalt is not the only thing that's being subducted. There's a whole bunch of sediments, there's serpentinites, there's, you know, gabbro underneath the metabasalt. So what you're subducting is likely a heterogeneous 